There was a dream in 1931 of a new Spain. But in 1936, after a turmoil of political wranglings and strikes and assassinations, the Spanish army, encouraged by Hitler and Mussolini and backed by the church, rose up against the new republic's popular front government. But the oppressed people of Spain had glimpsed a new future, and now their ramshackle armies were not going to let that future die. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. 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 The cause of the Republic was going to be joined by a large number of unemployed Welsh miners, some of whom went off without even telling their wives or parents. I hated fascism, I hated authoritarianism, and uh, I wanted to prevent a second world war, if you like. And this is the reason I went to Spain, and I regard the war in Spain as the beginning of the Second World War. Even though it was mixed up uh, with the Civil War as well, it was the grand rehearsal for the fascists in particular. Well, that night, the night before we went, I took my daughter to bed. It was uh, an awful hard decision right then, you see. But I knew that... Uh, once the day was cast, I had to carry it through. I had a mother and two sisters. It was a hard decision, and I knew they would be uh, wailing and weeping if I had told them. So I told them I was going to call one day for the weekend. I left home without uh, saying a word to my father and mother. I asked for an early call in the morning to get me up in time, and I left the house without a word to anyone. I went down to Caffelli, and I stayed the night with my sister. I thought that had uh, had to soften the blow a little. Well, in the morning, Jack Roberts came there, and he said to me, your wife's looking for you. So I said, where is she? Well, she, she's gone up the street, she said, and she's, I suppose, watching the buses. So I said, right, oh, I said, I'll go through the castle grounds now, into Nankara Road, and I'll get the bus there. And that's what I did. And then to London. Britain had signed the non-intervention pact, and the police were on the lookout for volunteers. They managed to stop some even before they left home. So the Welshmen who set out travelled in small groups, though the details of their stories hang together almost as though they'd gone in one great party. It was very much a cloak and dagger affair. We alighted from the train and looked for the contact we were supposed to meet. A man carrying a book under his arm. We were carrying a, a tin of corned beef so that he'd recognise us. This man passed us, and I approached him, I said, are you looking for a party from South Wales? He said, Christ, only three of you. I'm expecting 40. The great Paris exhibition was on, and with a weekend return from Victoria, it cost 34 shillings, you could get there without a passport. But not many unemployed miners could lay their hands on 34 bob. Of course it was the Communist Party that provided the machinery for us to go to Spain. I went to... Victoria Station via Cardiff. We had attaché cases from a bookshop in London and we went in tools to Victoria Station, got our weekend tickets and walked up and down in tools with a fella named Jack. Suddenly two big detectives come onto us. They had the usual big feet and they said, we think you are going to Spain. I said, we are going for a jolly weekend to Paris. He said, I think you are going to Spain. I said, no, well, you'd better be back on Monday or you'll be in trouble. The international law of non-intervention had been passed, so it was technically illegal for you to go to Spain. It's not easy to get there. Anyway, I contacted the anti-fascist committee in London, and we left uh, by boat train. But before we got onto the boat, uh, we were uh, interrogated by the uh, special branch. And uh, we were asked, well, where are you going? But we were interviewed one at a time because we didn't, even though there was a group going, we didn't travel together. We traveled separately as individuals as well. So I was asked, you know, well, what is your job? Well, I'm a coal miner. Oh, how can you afford to go to uh, Paris for a weekend? Uh, well, I said, I've been saving up. 
And uh, they didn't believe me, I knew that, but I had to say something, and this is the, uh, uh, the line I took. Uh, anyhow, uh, they let me go, and uh, when I got on the French side, here again I was interrogated, but not by a special branch, by a uniform, the customs people. And they said, are you going to Spain? To Spain? No. So you go to Paris for a weekend. And they didn't bother being uh, about the niceties. They said, all right, if you want to go to Spain and get killed, that's your business. Pass. But as soon as we arrived on the boat, the instructions we had from the start, don't talk to anybody, don't tell anybody where you're going, or it's all very ashes. There was an old gent sitting in the corner. We didn't know him from Adam. He turned around and he said, uh, Where are you going to Spain? Are you going? He looked at him and said, oh, You're going to Spain, we're doing good Spain for. Huh? Condon said, I feel like a drink, so I'm going to the bar. In about ten minutes' time, he came back shouting, everybody's going to Spain, who lot? So we joined him in the bar, and there was about 30 Irishmen, and they were all going to Spain. And the boat was full of people singing the international <laughs> across. And this is the secret voyage you're supposed to be making. Paris by uh, uh, Charlotte Halden, the wife of Professor Halden. We were told that she would be meeting us at the station in Paris, and she wore a red rose in her coat. In Paris, we separated from the Irish and called a taxi and asked for a plastic combat. That was our place of contact. We jumped in the taxi and he took us to the plastic combat. And when we offered him money, he said, no, salute, comrade, no money. We were put up in various uh, small hotels and pensions. And, uh, but there were uh, groups of people coming from other countries at the same time. And I found there were about 400 uh, odd uh, international uh, uh, brigaders, if you like, or potential in, 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 in uh, the Blasco Combat District at that time. And the hotels were full of them. But uh, in uh, France, uh, the uh, mayor is also chief of police. So the mayor in that area was a communist. So he was also chief of the police, so the police didn't bother us at all. We had been up all night singing all, all the way over from England. We hadn't had any sleep. So myself and Condon went to look for a meal first of all and try and find somewhere to sleep. We went to a cafe and uh, by gestures we called the, the waitress over. We were trying to work. Condon said, well, I'll make her understand what we want. So he drew a pig for bacon, and then went to get his cockadoodle for, for a egg. So she giggled, went back, but she brought it. So Condon was very chuffed about this. He, had, he could master the, the language barrier. Well, as we were having our food, a young Breton came in. You know, like the Breton Indians used to sell onions in South Wales. Uh, blackberry. And he stood by the bar talking to the girl, and they were chatting about us, obviously. So then she come and said, well, I'll ask him if he can find us a place to sleep. So he called him over, and he said, Breton, speak English? I speak English. But he couldn't speak a word of English. So Condon said, you, me? No, 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 me, him, you, no, 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 to the girl. So we slunk out of the restaurant, red face room. Well, we didn't find any place of sleep, and then we went to the Guardian Ord that night, and it was like a scene from the First World War. The train was a, a troop train. There were no, all wooden seats. The platform was filled with wives and sweethearts giving, saying goodbye to the people. The whole train was going to Spain. There seemed to be people on the train who were keeping out a watch for people going to Spain. 
Uh, there was one man particularly who'd walk up and down all the time trying to overhear conversations. And a woman who, every time you came near the station, would take up her bag and go and stand by the door. But when the train didn't stop, she came uh, and sat down again. We were told to take a ticket for Ali and get off at Tamaris at 12 midday, cross the tracks and go to a cafe with cross pipes. We all got off, walked across the tracks, into the, the cafe and out of the back where there were a long line of taxis. We were given very careful instructions that we were to go out to avoid detection and to go merely to and take the first cab in the rank and he would then take us to his house. We were told to wake at two o'clock in the morning, go down the steps and wait outside the door. These uh, were huge doors but there was a wooden door in, in the centre of it. And to wait for the switch of brakes and then dash out. The six of us were down there in the dark and we heard the police going around and naturally everybody kept quiet. But about five minutes after the police had gone round the rounds, a lorry screeched up and we opened the door, jumped on and away he went. The lorry actually didn't stop, he was jumping on as it was going. Uh, well, round about half past nine, two hours late, the bus came. He whipped us out very, very quickly into the bus, all in darkness. And all I knew was a lot of Spanish being spoken and a tremendous smell of garlic, which, which overwhelmed me. Well, we didn't find out until much later that all these Spaniards were Argentinians. And they took us in a frightening nightmare ride, trying to make up two hours late, down to the Pyrenees. We came to a valley, which I now know to be the Tetch Valley. It was dark. Outside a town which I think is Ambilie, we went into a vast barn where we supped, served by French girls and superintended by what I think was the local French Communist Party. There we were given haversacks and rope sandals and a packed lunch. We got, got in the buses again. He goes swooping down one hill and up another hill. Uh, then he'd crawl over the top and sometimes he'd halt and then he'd see a flash or a flare in the mountain and he'd proceed on down the other side. Occasionally, very often near a village in the mountains, maybe two flares would come. He'd immediately break to a stop, turn around and go another route. Presumably along the whole of the, of the, of the, of the frontier line, there were these members of the organization sending us to Spain who were keeping a lookout, watching presumably for the uh, functionaries of the non-intervention committee. Then we got out, a long line of men under what I thought was olive trees. Guides came along with berries, bandoliers and sticks. And they said in French, no talking, no talking. Forward, boys, forward, alley, alley. And we marched off into the dark. This guide stopped us all. We, I would imagine we'd be about 90 or more in number at this time. And the guide said that anybody would feel they just couldn't do the whole climb. Better turn back then, because you weren't going to stop for anybody from there on. Nobody back, we carried on, and the program was then that you walk, very much like in the army, you walk an hour, ten minutes of a break, walk an hour and ten minutes of a break. The guides then, they gave us the admiration, quiet, be quiet. We went down the road now, climbed up the embankment onto the railway, across the railway bridge, onto over the over the river a railway bridge over the river. Well, when we crossed in this bridge, Jim Brewer had an, a razor in his pocket and I'll never forget it. The razor fell out onto the iron bridge and we all froze. It it was like a, a mammoth explosion in the dead of the night and everybody walking quiet on tiptoes. 
Anyway, we got over the bridge. We went through an orchard. And the dog barked at us. Okay, but kept very quiet. And then we eventually got onto the mountains. We travelled past a uh, farmyard, you know, it was in the night now, and you heard dogs barking from the farm. Travelled up till dawn. At dawn, he said, you'll have to rest now. And when we come in, in, in this place in dawn, there were three cherry trees, loaded with cherries. And we went on them like locusts and all <laughs> were eaten away. Well, we slept that day, and nine o'clock that night, when it started to go at dusk, we started off again. And the mountains are something like the own mountains here, but there's one on top or another over them. So we traveled, and it was dawn the next day, when a little milestone like that with France this side and Spania the other side, that was the frontier. The first sight of Spanish territory was to see this um, sentry out of this little shack that he had on top of the mountain there. Eh? A blue blouse, bandolier across his shoulder, rifle on his shoulder, a couple of pistols around his waist, a big Alsatian do dog at his heel, and he felt that nobody would dare attack this man because he had all the armory that every, anybody wanted to defend himself. He was dressed up something like Panko Villa. He had armaments all around him, only short little fella. And then he took us out onto the path and he got on a, a huge rock and he started to this semaphore business. And they were, I suppose he was telling us, telling the people down there how many we were so that they could bring the camions up. But when we got down there, there were three camions for us, so I suppose he gave a fairly correct number. And then we went on to this uh, castle, St. Ferdinand, uh, some name of some Spanish king anyway. In a very short time, somebody brings out coffee, a slice of bread, and a sardine. And whatever you may think of, you see, this was the finest meal I think I've ever had in my life. A slice of bread, one sardine, and a cup of coffee. It was wonderful. As it was getting light about 5 a.m., we were climbing a narrow track, and on each side of the, the track were bundles of wood for the charcoal burners. The guys shouted, Ali, get moving quick. As we reached the top of the path, pass, on the top was a stone monolith. On one side it said France, on the other side Espania. We were in Spain and we were in the Civil War. People were coming from everywhere to support the Republican government. One unemployed Welsh collier, Alan Menai Williams, had been in the regular army, really to have something to do. Now he was to join the German anti-Nazi Telmann battalion. There was an American who came to see me and he asked me um, what qualifications I had. And I said I'd been in the RAMC and I was a trained uh, medical man. So he said, uh, well, right, we'll put you into the medical corps, the uh, International Brigade. I was at Albacete, I think, for about four days. A uh, very strange place to be because uh, I was one Englishman there. Who, uh, there was no other Englishman there except myself. There was a few Americans. There was a lot of Spaniards, Germans, Italians, they were all there, Frenchmen, Belgians. Um, from Albacete, then, I was sent to the Jarama Front, where I was, uh, I joined the Thelman Battalion as a first aid orderly. In other words, I'd been in Spain, I think, about five days before I was thrown into the front. We were all uh, put in a group together, and uh, we were given khaki type of uniforms. Well, I had the blue suits, which I hadn't had long, uh, two pound ten from Burton's. And uh, so I didn't know what to do with it. And anyway, I saw a, uh, a, a farm worker passing by and asked him, he's about my height, would you like a suit? The uniforms we were fitted out with were ski suits. And the helmet was a, a French army helmet. The bandolier was a cavalry bandolier. So we were a mixture of infantry, cavalry, and Lord knows what, skiers. They put us to understand that when we signed that form that we were Republican soldiers and we were under the jurisdiction of Republican 
government. So he said, okay, we'll accept that, and that's what we've done. The first training we had were with wooden sticks. It is only about two days before we had orders to move into action, we were issued with rifles. They didn't fire the darn things because most of them wouldn't fire. The one I had, I think it had a barrel about four feet long. Uh, might have been used by Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo, for all I know, and it was a French one. We also had a machine gun there, which they called the Shusho. It takes it apart, and there was nobody capable of putting it back together again. It consisted of two huge long springs and a barrel and a few bits and pieces. It was hanging about there for quite a while. I don't know what happened to it, but once we'd taken it to pieces, that was the beginning and the end of it. I suppose I was training all together. It took us about three weeks. Then we'd go on to marching, go out in the morning, and we'd find that we had a Frenchman. And we had to learn French for the orders. The next day we'd have a German and possibly a Spaniard. Okay? And when these Spaniards give the order, it used to amuse me because they used to make it so long that <coughs> if he wanted to turn right, they'd start to shout when he was about 100 yards from the corner you had to turn. The order went something like this. Cambio la direccione de la cabeza de la coloma por la escuda. Hip! <laughs> and when the hip come, you were somewhere by the corner, like. Well, we had to get used to that, and then with the Germans, with the links, 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 as we were marching. The, the trouble was that uh, I think that when our training was finished, or supposed to be finished, we were more confused than we started. Well, when he came to trends again, obviously there'd be nobody in the world to beat ex wells miners. This part was quite easy for him. But Jack Roberts of Abertrudel had other talents. He made these drawings when, later, he was sent to a school for officers away from the front line. Just look at the detail. Clearly the work of a man who could have walked in Santos, as long as nobody asked about his politics. Jack, you now he became a, a bit of a master on the machine gun. He could judge distance, but he could put his sights right. And it was remarkable to see the way that uh, a man who had never seen a machine gun before could use it. We were using our time very often in the evening, dismantling these in the dark and assembling them, because as the instructor would say, it's quite possible that at some point in the dark, you could use your gun, rifle or machine gun, and it's no good unless it's functional. So you've got to be able to dismantle it and uh, assemble it for your own safety. But when he used the rifle, it was a, a comical thing, because he was left-handed, you see. When we were on target practice, the little target practice we had, Jack would pick up his rifle and swing it round and everybody would duck. <laughs> he didn't know where the hell we could fire, being left-handed. Well then, he was told that the Russians were making rifles left-handed for left-handed men, and they advised him to go to Russia <laughs> to wait. <laughs> there didn't seem to be any organizations, you know, as we'd uh, look at it in the British Army. Then some to be seemed to be want to do this, some seemed to be wanted to do that. So I told the boys, well, this, this, this seemed to be a, a kind of a cockeyed army to me. There's no discipline here. Well, he said, well, we'd love to wait and see it, John. With such small training, I realized that I was not going to survive because I could hardly load and unload a rifle. So I realized I must find somebody who was a trained soldier to help me. And immediately I met two jocks, Andy and Tom, who had been soldiers in the British Army. And I said, you must show me what to do. And they said, OK, Taft, we'll show you. There were so many things they hadn't bargained for. Ideologies are one affair, foreign bugs another. They needed the reassurance of the familiar. They wrote home to explain the best way of sending woodbines through the mail. Their pay, when they got it, was about eightpence a day. The food was always dished up, something of a stew with everything in it, including mule meat or goat's meat or whatever was there. And, of course, the rice was always thrown in, more or less, as a vegetable. But old boys, they didn't want that, so they asked for their own cooks. 
because we wanted rice pudding after our dinner that we've been used to in this country. Anyway, we got our cooks to make rice pudding. Some of them made it all right, others made it that they wanted a hammer and chisel. Well, I was lucky, I always had the best. I must have had a good cook. But the boys, uh, the Spaniards, used to laugh at us. Roca con leche, oh, it was a great joke. Rice with milk. But some of them now had the courage to taste it. And before you could say knife, they all wanted it. So the rice came out of the soup and into the rice pudding. One volunteer from Aberdare wrote home and asked his mother to send him some Welsh cakes through the communist headquarters in London. Welsh cakes, antidote to the Spanish mule that took some stomaching. Well, whenever they came in with the mule on their shoulders, as we were in the cookhouse, that was the next day's meal. It stank to high heaven. There was there's no smell on earth like it. I suppose it would be all right uh, if you went into a cemetery where they disinterred the dead. It, it might have a a comparison, but otherwise I've never smelled anything like it in my life. And being a vegetarian, more or less, I had to eat that to keep alive. And you could understand that every meal that I had with the stew and the mule meat was anathema. I didn't want it. But if I could have a bit of rice and a few beans, I was in God's pocket. When we got to Madrigueras, this young lad, he told me that the local father was a, a member of the fascist party. Uh, when the hostilities broke out, he had got him into the church tower and he was shooting at the women and children where they draw water from and do their washing. And two brothers went up into the tower and they caught this priest, they put the rope around his neck and threw him out. His head was on the rope and his body was on the floor. It was a war of the bitterest possible bloodshed. Wholesale executions were carried out by both sides, and not merely of those who carried arms. More than 100,000 Spaniards were executed by their fellow countrymen off the field of battle. Soon, the new members of the International Brigade, we had a lemming approach, said one Welsh collier later, soon they would feel the hell of a civil war explode all around them. the women and children as a cover, throwing these grenades over and they run away at the back.